Questions to the Prime Minister, Mr. Gareth Thomas. Number one, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow marks one year on from the Grenfell Tower fire. I know that members from all sides of this House will join me in saying that this unimaginable tragedy remains at the forefront of our minds. On Monday, I had the privilege to attend the very moving vigil in memory of those who were lost that night, and I was honoured to take part in an iftar with members of the local community. Let me again reassure the House that we are doing everything that we can to see that the survivors of Grenfell get the homes and support that they need and the truth and justice that they deserve. Mr Speaker, I would also like to take this opportunity to wish the England men's football team the very best in the upcoming World Cup. This morning, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Gareth Thomas. Uh, I and I'm sure the whole House will want to join the Prime Minister in her comments about the Grenfell uh, tragedy uh, 12 months ago. And my constituents certainly will want me to echo her good wishes to the England uh, football team. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask the Prime Minister, though, last year the top five co cooperatives in our country paid more than four times the corporation tax of Amazon, Facebook, eBay, Starbucks and E.O.N. The Prime Minister, I'm sure, will want to praise the patriotism of those who have signed up to the Fair Tax Mark campaign. But might this not be an opportunity to encourage the Department for Business and the Treasury to take a more proactive and supportive interest in the growth of cooperative and mutual businesses? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I, can I uh, thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, comments about his constituency and uh, the support and, and uh, thoughts that they have for all those who were affected by the Grenfell Tower fire? On the issue of taxation, he may have noticed that actually HMRC has been requiring some of the large companies that he, uh, that he has uh, referenced in his question to pay more tax and has ensured that we get that tax from them. And of course, they look fairly across all types of institutions uh, that operate in this country. Uh, Mr. Mark Harper. Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the key reasons why people voted to leave the European Union was to get back control of immigration policy so that we could welcome people to our country based on their skills and their talents, not, not based on the country from which they are from. You can't stay in the European economic area, which we're debating later today, without continuing with free movement of people. So can I urge the Prime Minister to stick to our policy of leaving the single market, getting back control of our immigration policy, and not listening to the many Labour voices who want to continue with unlimited migration from the European Union? I say to my right honourable friend, I absolutely agree with him. The Labour Party used to say that they wanted control of our borders. Now what they want is free movement. We will take back control of our borders. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wish the England team all the best in the tournament in Russia and hope it goes really, really well. This week, Mr Speaker, is an England win. This week is National Carers Week, Mr Speaker, and I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to those thousands of usually unpaid carers whose commitment to family and friends too often goes unrecognised. Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister pointed out, tomorrow marks one year on the anniversary of the Grenfell Tower fire. I'll be meeting families again tomorrow at their silent march. But the sad truth and reality is that many of them are still waiting for the security of a permanent home one year on from that disaster. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister met uh, President Donald Trump last week, did she do as the Foreign Secretary suggested and ask him to take over the Brexit negotiations? <laughs> Mr Davis, you're a senior and supposedly cerebral member of the House. Well, in a leap year anyway. 
you must attempt to recover your composure, man. I'm worried about you, and I'm worried for you. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. On the Brexit negotiations, I might remind the honourable gentleman, right honourable gentleman, that before December, Labour cast doubt on whether we would get a joint report agreed. We did. Before March, he cast doubt on whether we'd get an implementation period, and we did. But I wanted, Mr Speaker, if I may, just to respond to the comment that the right honourable gentleman made about the very important subject of uh, uh, providing those who were uh, the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire with permanent homes. Uh, Just so that I can make clear to the House, 203 households were in need of a new home. Every household has received an offer of temporary or permanent accommodation. 183 have accepted an offer of a permanent home. But I just wanted to say this, because it isn't just about the buildings. It's not just about the bricks and mortar of a home. People who suffered that night are having to rebuild their lives. Many of them lost somebody, uh, members of their families, with whom they had been living and making a home for years. They lost all their possessions. They lost their mementos. They lost anything that reminds them of the person they loved. When they move into that new home, they will be restarting their lives. And I wanted to pay tribute to all the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire for the strength and dignity that they have shown. Mr Speaker, I too pay tribute to the families for all that they've been through and all the fortitude they've shown. But sadly, the reality is that some of them have still not got a permanent home to move into. It's very important for the mental well-being of everybody. They have somewhere they can call home and they know it is their home. Mr Speaker, last week the Prime Minister confirmed we would leave the European Union in March 2019 and the transition would end in December 2020. But we now know the Government is working on the basis that transition could continue for a further year till December 2021. Could you be clearer today? Which December are we talking about? No, the right honourable gentleman is quite wrong in his, uh, uh, the way he has uh, put this to the House, so let me be clear to the House. I think what he's trying to talk about is the backstop arrangement that we have agreed. Let's be very clear what this backstop is. This is, this is an arrangement. This is an arrangement that will be put in place in the circumstances in which it is not possible to put the future new customs arrangement in place by the 1st of January 2021. And it is there to ensure that if that is those new customs arrangements are not in place, that we are able to continue on the basis that there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. We expect the future we are working to make sure that the future customs arrangements overall deal with the issue of ensuring no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. We don't want the backstop to be necessary. We are working to ensure that we can have our future customs arrangements in place on the 1st of January 2021. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I'm not really sure whether it's a backstop or a backslide that she's talking about here. (laughs) Last week, uh, last week I asked the Prime Minister and I'm sorry to bring this subject up again because it's probably quite painful for her, but when is the government's Brexit white paper going to be published? Because she did say it would be put, it'd be published before the June EU Council summit. Is that still the case? Where is it? No, I, I didn't actually say that. I said the white paper would be published, and we will be publishing it. We will be bringing ministers together. We will be bringing ministers together after the June Council, and the white paper will be published thereafter. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it gets ever more confusing because at the weekend the Cabinet Office Secretary told the BBC that it would not now be until July. Can I offer a solution to her? Instead of worrying about this white paper on which the Cabinet would have to agree, how about making it a green paper in which all their disagreements are in the open and we can all make a comment on it? But if the Government does not, Mr Speaker, as looked lightly, have its detailed proposals ready for the June summit, 
Surely the Prime Minister can't be going to Brussels without anything to negotiate on. So is she going to seek a delay to that summit while the government decides what its position actually is? Perhaps I, could, perhaps I could just help the right honourable gentleman. The June European Council is not a summit about the Brexit negotiations. There will be many issues that the European Union leaders will be discussing at the June European Summit, including the important issue of sanctions against Russia. Uh, I will be pressing to ensure that we maintain sanctions against Russia uh, because the Minsk agreements have not been put in place, and indeed I think there are some areas where we should be enhancing that sanctions regime. He says, he says that my right hon. Friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, said that the White Paper would be published in July, and that is different from what I have just said. I have to say to him, after the June European Council is July. <laughs> he, but if he wants if he wants to talk about differences of opinion, I'll tell him I'll tell him what division really is. It's Labour members. It's all very well the Deputy Leader pointing like that. Division is members of the Labour Party circulating instruction manuals on how to deselect all the Labour MPs. Mr Speaker, you've got to face the fact, you've got to face the fact there may now be a meltdown. <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, they're not actually my words, but those of the Foreign Secretary, even as his fellow Cabinet Ministers are preparing people for the Government's negotiations, which he clearly thinks are going to end in disaster. And last week, he also took aim at the Treasury, who is sitting absolutely next to him, calling them the heart of Remain. He criticised them, saying what they don't want is friction at the borders, what they don't, what they don't want any disruption to the economy. So does the Prime Minister back the Foreign Secretary in wanting more friction and more disruption to the economy? Let's talk about the positions on this issue. Labour said they wanted to do new trade deals. Labour said they wanted to do new... Order! Order! I want to hear both the questions and the answers. And as the record shows... Order! I don't require any assistance in this matter. As the record shows, that will always happen, however long it takes. And there's a lot of noise and much gesticulation from members on both sides of the House. But I want to hear the questions and I want to hear the answers. The Prime Minister, we're grateful. Because the Honourable Member for Bolsover is absolutely right. We're in government, not Labour. We've set out our position on the border. But what we see is a Labour Party that said it wanted to do trade deals and now wants to be in a customs union that will stop that. They said they wanted to control our borders and now they want free movement. They said they would respect the referendum and now they won't rule out a second referendum. And that's the difference between us. The Conservative Party in government are going to deliver on the will of the British people. Mr Speaker, in the parallel universe inhabited by the Foreign Secretary, you are apparently not respecting the referendum result unless you want friction at the borders and disruption of the economy. Mr Speaker, the Cabinet is divided and they are briefing against each other. They are even whispering during Prime Minister's question time. And the Prime Minister has been left with no white paper on which to negotiate. Last week, the transition period was delayed by a year in the space of 24 hours, and yesterday, a deal with her backbenchers was reneged on within hours. Meanwhile, the economy is weakening, industry is increasingly alarmed at the sheer ineptitude of her government. How 
much more damage is the Prime Minister doing, going to do to this country before she realises the important thing is to get a deal for the people of this country, not one to appease the clashing giant egos of her cabinet? It's the Labour Party in opposition that are trying to frustrate Brexit. That are trying to stop us getting a deal for the British people. This government will deliver on Brexit. This government will deliver a Brexit for jobs. This government will deliver a Brexit that, goods, that is good for Britain. And if he wants to talk about the economy, if he wants to talk about the economy, the last Labour government left office, left office with half a million more people out of work than when they went into office. What's happened under the Conservatives? We have seen nearly half a million more people in work just over the last year. That's Conservatives delivering on a Britain that's fit for the future. And I've heard that the Right Honourable Gentleman is trying to organise a music festival <laughs> Labour. Our, uh, our Passover. I'll pass over the fact it's going to have a solidarity tent, which obviously won't have any Labour MPs within it. <laughs> but I have to say to him, I, I don't know if all members of the House are aware of the Headline Act at Labour Live. The Headline Acts at Labour Live are the Shadow Chancellor and the Magic Numbers. Just about <laughs> sums them up. Must come to order. We must now hear a most courteous fellow, Richard Drax. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Would my right honourable friend join a growing number of her ministers who are very supportive of our bid for a one off grant of £18 million to repair Weymouth Harbour walls and improve flood defences? This work, not my wall, Weymouth Harbour wall. <laughs> Speaker. This work, this work is essential if planning permission is to be granted to redevelop an important retail and housing area in the resort, thereby safeguarding existing jobs, creating new ones and providing more homes. Well, can, I, can I first of all say to my honourable friend, I commend him on the work that he's done. I know he has worked hard on this whole issue of flood defences. I'm sure, however, that he will understand that ministers need to consider the various uh, options for allocations of the fund very carefully. We need to ensure that we're getting the best possible outcomes across the whole country. Um, and the scheme that he has referred to uh, is on the list of projects that is being considered for the £40 million fund. It's intended to support high-risk communities, and we anticipate, I can tell him, we can anticipate that a decision will be made by summer 2018. Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister gave a commitment that she would treat Scotland as part of a union of equals. Mm. Yes. Yet last night she pressed ahead with a power grab in yep. direct opposition yep. to Scotland's elected parliament. The Prime Minister silenced Scotland's voice, having broken constitutional convention and plunged Scotland into a constitutional crisis. Will the Prime Minister now commit to bringing forward emergency legislation so that the will of the Scottish Parliament can be heard and, more importantly, respected? Yeah. Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that we do expect that the outcome, and it will happen, that the outcome of the whole process of Brexit is going to be a significant increase in Holyrood's decision-making power. It is, not, it is not the case that this is in any way a power grab. Uh, we, over 80 areas of uh, responsibility, of decision-making, are going to flow direct to Holyrood. Only the SNP could say that getting 80 areas where they're going, more areas where they're going to take decisions was a power grab. If he wants to be concerned about the process that this House has followed in relation to the legislation, his real question should be why it was the Labour Party who manoeuvred last night, used procedural manoeuvres to ensure that there was no debate about the amendments referred to on Scotland. Ian Blackford. 
Mr Speaker, I really do hope that the people of Scotland listen very carefully to what the Prime Minister said, because the reality of the situation is that powers that are enshrined under the Scotland Act in 1998 are being grabbed back by this Scotland were not given the courtesy of even debating it last night. It is a democratic outrage. The people of Scotland will not be disrespected by this Parliament. Mr Speaker, under the circumstances, given the disrespect that's shown, I have got no option but to ask that this House now sits in private. I'm not hearing that at this time, and I'm not obliged to do so, is my clear understanding. Order, the Honourable Gentleman. Order! The Right Honourable Gentleman can resume his seat. I'll happily take advice, but I don't think I'm obliged to hear that at this time. Well, what I'd say to the Right Honourable Gentleman is, I think the standing order requires that the matter be put, if it is to be put forthwith. It order, order. It might be for the convenience of the House for the matter to be addressed at the conclusion of Prime Minister's questions. And if the honourable, right honourable gentleman, who had not signalled to me his intention to do this now, wish order, 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 I mean, well, it, uh, I'm always grateful for the moral support of the right honourable lady, the member for Broxter, even when it is chunted from a sedentary position. I realise that it's done for my benefit, but I think I can handle the matter. We could have the, we could have the vote now, but we could order, we could have a vote now, and, or it could be taken at the end. If the honourable gentleman which is to indicate a desire to conduct such a, a vote now. So be it. Right. I, I beg to move. I, I beg to move. Well, my advice, I've had a mixed sequence of advice, is that order, this has not happened, but order, my view is that it is better for the vote to be conducted. Order. My view is that it is better for the vote to be conducted at the conclusion of questions to the Prime Minister. No, I'm not. Order. 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 I always admit of the maximum number of votes and divisions, as the right honourable gentleman should know from his experience in the House. But I hope that he will trust me that I know of what I speak. There can be a division, and it will be at the end of this session, not now. That is the end of the matter. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, might I ask... No, no, I'm not debating. No, resume your seat. Resume your seat. Mr Blackford, no, I'm... No, you're not moving anything. Resume your seat, young man. Resume your seat. No, no, no. Mr Blackford, resume your seat. No, no, resume your seat. Mr. Blackford, I must order, order, order. The House will have heard very clear order. Please, the House will have heard very clearly my acceptance that there can be a vote on this matter. Order, Mr. Linden. I say to you, and I say it in the kindest possible spirit, don't tell me what the procedures of this House are. I'm telling you that there can be a vote at the end of this session, and not now. I'm not going to... No, no, Mr Blackford, order, 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 under the... Resume your seat, Mr Blackford. Under the power given to me by Standing Order No. 43, in light of the persistent and repeated refusal of the Right Honourable Gentleman to resume his seat when so instructed, I order the Right Honourable Gentleman to withdraw immediately from the House for order for the remainder of this day's sitting. He is so in. Right, he won't. Right, well, we'll have to have the vote. Very well. Very well. Very well. I'm back. Order, 
Order! 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 Mr. Chair Warden! Yeah, you're a very jocular fellow, but you're a little overexcitable today. Calm. Long time to go. Uh, I say order! I say only to the house, order! I say only to the House, what a pity, because there are Scottish National Party members of Parliament who had questions on the order paper. And as colleagues know, I always like to get to the end of the order paper. They would have had their chance, and they've lost that chance by their own choice. Mr Luke Hall. Mr Speaker, with the amount of people leaving, it feels like one of my after-dinner speeches. <laughs> <laughs> Youth unemployment in uh, Thornbury and Yates. Order, order. No, no, I, I, I recognise the house. Order, I recognise the house. It, it, it is in a state of some excitement. Even Mr Hollinbrake, who's n- normally a, a model of solemnity, <laughs> is looking as though Christmas has come early. But... <laughs> or, order... <laughs> I beseech the House to try to resume calm, not least out of courtesy to members with questions on the paper, to whom and to whose questions we wish to listen. Luke Hall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Youth unemployment in Thorbury and Yates is down 23% in the last year, and scrapping stamp duty for over 80% of first-time buyers means more people in South Gloucestershire can afford a home of their own. Does the Prime Minister agree that whilst the party opposite can only offer higher taxes, fewer jobs and broken promises on student debts, this Government will be focusing on providing opportunity for young people up and down this country? Well, can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I'm pleased to hear that the number, significant number of young people in Thornbury and Yate who now have jobs and are in work. And in fact, if we look at the figures since 2010, nationally, youth unemployment has fallen by around 141 every single day since 2010. Uh, but he's absolutely right. It's not just about ensuring young people are in jobs. It's helping them get, more, uh, get on the housing ladder and get that home of their own. That's why we're building more homes. And that's why that cut in stamp duty has been so good for young people, put, enabling them to be in work and enabling them to have their own home. Sandy Martin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister tell this House what actions she has taken? to ensure that no further EU citizens that have been resident in this country for more than 30 years are going to be refused British citizenship like the former Mayor of Ipswich was. Can I say to the, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I am not aware of the particular circumstances of the former Mayor of Ipswich. What we have done, and what we have done in relation to the uh, European Union citizens who are living here in the United Kingdom as we leave the European Union, is negotiated a very good arrangements which ensure that their rights here are protected. In congratulating the member for Harwich and North Essex upon his knighthood, and I do so with some warmth and feeling as we've known each other for 30 years, I call Sir Bernard Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Can I uh, join with my right honourable friend in remembering the anniversary of the Grenfell fire? Uh, Can I commend her for the way she has established the inquiry that is looking into that tragedy? Because can I testify to her, having met victims of the Grenfell fire, as she has, they are showing growing confidence that they will get the findings of that inquiry that they want to make sure that such a thing never happens again. And that is, uh, I think, a testament to her personal courage and persistence in making sure that the inquiry was not blown off course by the understandable anger that followed the immediate tragedy. 
Well, can I, can I also add my personal congratulations to my uh, right, honourable friend on uh, his knighthood? Uh, and can I say that I absolutely uh, agree with him at the importance of ensuring that the uh, inquiry into the Grenfell Tower fire is able to provide the truth, to get to the answers of exactly what, uh, wh- why what happened happened, and to ensure that justice is provided for the victims and survivors. It is a statutory inquiry. It has the power to compel witnesses and the production of evidence. I think that is important. Anyone who is found to have misled the inquiry would face prosecution. I hope this gives confidence to the survivors and and people in the local community that this is an inquiry which will indeed get to the truth. Julie Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, My constituent, Ian, has lifelong profound learning and physical disabilities. He's doubly incontinent, cannot wash, dress or cook for himself. He's no notion of personal safety and left unsupervised is at risk. He is able to live independently thanks to the support of his elderly mother, who is herself unwell, and by virtue of a local authority social care package. Now, Ian's PIP application that he needs to fund this care has been refused on the grounds that he can cope unaided. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that there is something very wrong with a system that punishes citizens whose only crime is to be born disabled? Will she agree to investigate on behalf of the thousands of vulnerable people? Who are being made to suffer. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that obviously she raised a specific case, and I'm sure she will understand I don't have the details to address that specific case, and I don't think it would be right to do so here in this chamber. What I can assure her and other members of the House are that individual cases that are raised with me in Prime Minister's questions are taken extremely seriously, and this one will be no exception. So I will ensure that the case is looked at urgently by the relevant Minister. Um, Obviously, cases are complex, they are multifaceted, but the case will be looked at urgently. Nadine Dorries. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents have been incredibly tolerant in the face of the fiasco that has followed their commuter journey following the reorganisation of the timetables. However, added to their misery is the fact that when trains do turn up, they are incredibly overcrowded. I have written to Govia three times and asked them, could they please conduct a risk assessment on the safety of my passengers, my, my constituents, who are their passengers, as they come into London? And three times Govia have refused to answer me. Could the Prime Minister please use her good officers to ensure that on overcrowded trains at the moment and those suffering because of the rail delays, that our passengers are safe. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that she raises an important issue, and the experience that passengers uh, for Govia Thameslink, but also Northern, have uh, had as a result of the change in timetable and the way that was done is simply unacceptable. And uh, it is important as that they improve the services. They have plans in place. I think Govia uh, Thameslink, for example, are introducing a new timetable that is better than the pre-May timetable, which will have 200 more planned journeys. But of course, passengers need to know, uh, they, passengers want to feel that they're able to travel in trains that aren't uh, uh, too crowded. And certainly this uh, is an issue that I'm sure that Govia Thameslink will be looking at very seriously. We are working, the Department of Transport is working with the company and Northern to ensure that we can provide the services that people deserve. They pay for a ticket, they book a ticket, they pay for a season ticket, they deserve to have a decent journey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The average length of time that a Stroud constituent has to wait to go to the Gloucester and Cheltenham Centre for a PIP appeal is now 41 weeks. It's 31 weeks for an ESA appeal. Now, during that period of time, constituents are now losing motability cars and suffering enormous hardship. Will the Prime Minister promise to get a grip of this and to make sure that this hardship is not endured any longer? That of course it's important that people are able to have their appeals heard in a timely fashion. My right honourable friend, the Work and Pension Secretary, is looking at exactly this issue to see what can be done in the tribunal system to ensure that people get a more timely result. Mr John Whittingdale, Um, will my right honourable friend join me in welcoming the Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament, Mr Andrei Parubi, 
to Westminster, although he, I suspect he is utterly mystified by the events <laughs> about ten minutes ago. Uh, will she take this opportunity to reaffor- reaffirm the support of the UK for Ukraine, which is in the front line against Russian aggression? And does she share the concern of Ukraine as well as Lithuania and Poland about the strategic threat of the Nord Stream 2 Russian gas pipeline? Well, can I say to my right honourable friend that I'm very happy to reaffirm the United Kingdom's commitment and support for the Ukraine. Uh, I was pl- very pleased, only a matter of a few weeks ago, to be able to have a further conversation with President Poroshenko uh, about the support that we are able to give to the Ukraine. The work we're doing with Ukraine to, uh, in the reforms that are uh, being put through, but also, as I mentioned earlier in response to a previous question, I think it's important that the European Union maintains the sanctions on Russia. Uh, because Minsk agreements have not been put in place and fully implemented, and I think we continue to need to show uh, the, uh, the Russians uh, that we do not accept what they have done in the Ukraine. Yeah. Stevens. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah. 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 It's, it's almost a year since the Government promised its domestic violence and abuse bill, and publication of that bill will trigger a cross-party amendment with widespread support to decriminalise abortion across the whole of the UK, which is long overdue. Will the bill be published before the summer recess and will the Prime Minister give a commitment today on the floor of the House that her MPs will have a free vote on decriminalisation? First of all, the Honourable Lady has raised a a number of aspects of this issue. The first one I would say is that the reason that that the um, Domestic Violence and Abuse Bill will be published in draft first. But we have been taking our time through the consultation exactly. to work with those who are involved in uh, working with the victims of domestic violence and abuse, to hear to the, uh, from the, the yeah. victims and survivors of domestic violence and abuse, because we want to make sure that as we bring this legislation together in this new bill, we are getting it right for people. Yeah. Now, she refers to the issue of abortion. I believe that it is absolutely right that a woman should have the right to a safe and legal yeah. abortion. Uh, I, as regards Northern Ireland, uh, I believe it is the best way and my preferred way is for that decision to be taken by the elected politicians in Northern Ireland, because it is a devolved matter. As regards, as regards, votes, as regards votes on abortion in this House, they have always been treated as conscience matters, and therefore they will be subject to a free vote. Uh, Julia Lopez. Uh, NICE decides whether to fund new treatments for neuroblastoma, a vicious childhood cancer which is affecting my constituent, Isla Caton. Will the Prime Minister encourage NICE and drugs companies to do a deal to provide new treatments for children in Britain instead of families fundraising to receive such treatments in America? I, say, I know my, uh, my honourable uh, friend has raised this issue on behalf of her constituents. I believe she has a constituency case which, is particularly, uh, which uh, raises this particular issue. NICE is developing guidelines for the NHS on the use of dinutuximab beta, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, uh, for the treatment of high-risk neuroblastoma. And um, it's not been able to recommend the drug as a clinically and cost-effective use of resources in its draft guidance, but it has consulted stakeholders on its its draft recommendations. Um, It is an ongoing nice appraisal. It is not for government to intervene in that, but they will take all the comments that are made very uh, obviously into account when they're making their final guidance. And I think the manufacturer of the drug is currently making the drug available to some NHS patients through a compassionate use scheme and has agreed to continue the scheme for patients who are currently receiving treatment. Uh, Brendan O'Hara. Uh, <laughs> Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, Vernon Bogdaner called the noble Lord Lord Hailsham's amendment that we rejected yesterday a constitutional absurdity. Whilst it is essential that this House holds the Government to account and has meaningful votes on many things, does my right honourable friend agree that it is absolutely essential that the separation of powers is observed and that in any compromise amendment it is clear that the job of the Government and the job of Parliament is different? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable friend 
uh, that I am happy to, cl- to be clear about this situation. Of course, what we have seen is concerns raised about the role of Parliament in relation to the Brexit process. Um, what I agreed yesterday is that, the, as the Bill goes back to the Lords, we would have further discussions with colleagues over those concerns. And I have agreed this morning with the Brexit Secretary that we will bring forward an amendment in the Lords. But there are a number of as- issues, a number of things that will guide our approach in doing so. My honourable friend is absolutely right about the separation of powers and the different role between uh, the government and the uh, and Parliament. As my right honourable friend, the Brexit Secretary, made clear yesterday in the House, um, it, a government's hand in negotiations cannot be tied by Parliament. But government must be accountable to Parliament. Government determines policy, and Parliament uh, then we need parliamentary support to be able to implement that policy. But the other aspect of this that I am absolutely clear on is that I cannot countenance Parliament being able to overturn the will of the British people. Parliament gave the decision to the British people. The British people voted to leave the European Union, and as Prime Minister, I am determined to deliver that. Pete Wishart, not here. Jack Lepresti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fifteen months ago, the then Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government called in the planned expansion of the Mallet Gribbs Causeway in my constituency, a plan which represents huge economic benefit to the Bristol and South Gloucestershire area. There are 3,000 con- construction jobs. 3,750 permanent jobs and 150 new homes at stake in this expansion, as well as a significant amount of infrastructure investment. Now, will the Prime Minister urge the new Secretary of State to start as he means to go on and make a good decision quickly? Well, can I say to my honourable friend that uh, obviously he has referred to the independent public inquiry and that after that took place, my right honourable friend, the housing secretary, uh, called this decision in. He is considering the inspector's report. What I can say to my honourable friend is that I understand that the Secretary of State hopes to issue his decision on or before the published target date of the 2nd of August. Jeff Smith. Mr Speaker, it took nearly 5,000 cancelled trains in just three weeks for the Transport Secretary to notice the Northern Rail crisis. (laughs) If this Government can't run our railways properly, will the Prime Minister agree with businesses, council leaders and over 25 newspapers from across the region and give Transport for the North the powers it needs to do the job? Can I say to uh, the honourable gentleman that we have given Transport for the North unprecedented powers to influence decisions about transport investment in the North? But what's more, we've backed them up with £260 million of government funding. So it has the powers to deliver a transport strategy, which the government must formally consider, has powers to fund organisations and deliver transport projects. And those and their other powers are exactly what Transport for the North requested. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The the Prime Minister, I know, is aware of the severe difficulties that my constituents in Hitchin and Harperden have faced with recent uh, delays to train services. Would the Prime Minister reassure me and my constituents that, going forward, the Government will do everything it can to ensure that GTR and Network Rail get into shape to ensure a better quality and higher quality train service both now and into the future. Can I I say to my uh, honourable friend that, as I said in uh, response to the earlier question from our honourable friend, uh, the immediate priority is to ensure that we are seeing an improvement in services for the passengers on Govia Thameslink. Uh, and that is why they have introduced a new timetable, which is not the, uh, what will be the final timetable, but is better than the pre-May timetable. Time but what we also need to do is to ensure that they take the action so that they can bring forward that proposed new timetable, which will provide more services and better services for passengers. But in the long term, what the government is working to do is to bring train and track together so that we don't see problems like this in the future. Chris Law, not here. All these opposition opportunities are being lost. I think that that shouldn't continue. Chris Williamson. The Prime Minister will be aware that schools are often targeted in war zones. And a couple of months ago, I met year seven students from Leesbrook School in my constituency who implored me to ask the Prime Minister 
to sign the Safe Schools Declaration, which I understand has subsequently been signed. So my question to the Prime Minister today is, does that declaration mean that she will now veto future arms sales to brutal regimes like Saudi Arabia, which has been targeting schools as part of its military campaign in Yemen? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, the issue of the education of girls and boys in conflict zones is an important one. It was one which was addressed at the G7 summit. We have been clear as a United Kingdom government that we are providing financial support to ensure 12 years of quality education for girls, particularly in developing countries. Uh, and the G7 summit gave its commitment not only in financial terms to provide, as we contributed more, to provide for quality education, but also to focus that on those areas where there are conflict zones and where particular action needs to be taken to ensure that that education can be provided. Very sadly, my constituent, Gina Turgill, lost her life last week, aged 95. Gina survived the Krakow ghetto, Auschwitz-Birkenau, Birkenau, and she became known as the Bride of Belson when she married her, uh, her liberator. Will my right honourable friend join with me in celebrating the life of Gina, who dedicated her life to informing young people about the horrors of the Holocaust? and ensuring that although a light has gone out, her legacy lives. Can I say to my honourable friend that I am happy to join him in paying tribute to Gina Turgill and to the work that she did over so many years. She was one of the first survivors to go into schools to share her story. I have seen, as I'm sure other honourable and right honourable members have, the impact that a survivor from the Holocaust going into schools and explaining what happened has on young people. It is moving, and she so showed considerable determination and strength. And I think her example is truly humbling. And it, it's right that her legacy is going to live on in the National Holocaust Memorial and the accompanying education centre. That will be housing her testimony for generations to come. We must never forget what Gina taught us. We must fight hatred and prejudice in all its forms. Yeah. Anna McMorrin. On her walking holidays in Wales, the Prime Minister must have seen our beautiful beaches. But plastic is killing our oceans and polluting our seas. Would the Prime Minister stay in here for a few minutes after PMQs and listen to my 10-minute rule bill on plastic pollution, support it so we can save our seas? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, when I go walking in Wales, I tend to walk up and down hills rather than on the beaches, but I know that Wales has some fantastic beaches, and she's raised a very important issue about the plastic. She's raised a very important issue about marine plastic, and that is an issue which I think the UK public, as well as members across this House, have shown great energy in picking up this cause and wanting to fight against uh, plastic waste. And indeed, the UK is going to be leading the newly formed Commonwealth Clean Oceans Alliance jointly with Vanuatu. And we're committing £61 million to fund global research and improve waste management in developing countries to tackle plastic pollution. This again was another issue that we took forward in the G7 summit as well and got commitments in relation to dealing with uh, plastic waste uh, in that. And can I just say to the Honourable Lady, with the greatest of respect, I'm sorry, I think my diary has already been slightly changed as a result of what has been happening in the chamber today, and I will not be able to I regret, I won't be able to sit and listen to her bill. Uh, Mr Philip Davis. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that those people who want to have a meaningful vote in this House, which would allow this House to vote to stay in the European Union, uh, would be betraying the result of the referendum and show how much the Labour Party have lost touch with working class people up and down this country? And would she further agree that those people who want to take no deal from the government's negotiating hand would only incentivise the European Union not to negotiate at all in any meaningful way and betray not only the result of the referendum but betray the best interests of the British people. Can I say to my honourable friend, as we go ahead with these Brexit negotiations, we are, of course, ensuring that we're making preparations for all eventualities. Uh, That is entirely right and proper for the government to do. But as I set out uh, in in response to our honourable friend earlier, what I'm also clear about is that Parliament can 
not be uh, allowed. We cannot, I cannot countenance Parliament overturning the will of the British people. The British people were given the vote, uh, given the choice as to whether to stay in the European Union. This par- Parliament gave that choice to them overwhelmingly by the vote in this Parliament. It is right that we listen to the British people and we deliver what they asked us to do, which is to leave the European Union. Angela Crawley. Not here. Chris Evans. For large numbers of years, for numbers of years we used to hold in Islam we used to hold a commemorative march for test veterans to, com- to commemorate their service to our country. Last week they were in the House of Commons campaigning for a medal for their service. Will the Prime Minister look look at their look at their campaign and with a view to giving them a medal for their, their service they, they give to this country? Yeah. Well, can I say to the honourable gentleman, this is, uh, I think, the first time that the issue he's raised with me has been raised with me, and I'll look carefully at what he's said in the House. Charles Watling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, as a father of twin girls who, uh, happily growing up in Clacton, uh, enjoyed uh, a, a very equal uh, upbringing and education, I celebrate the announcement of the G7 supporting girls' education. Will my right honourable friend uh, agree with me that we should support equality for women across the globe? Yes, yes I'm very happy. I'm very happy. I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in agreeing with that, and in saying that there are many ways in which we can express that and put that into practice, not just in supporting girls' education, but the work in which we're doing on modern slavery, which does affect men as well as women. But we see many women from around the globe being trafficked into other countries for sexual or labour exploitation, and we are leading the uh, leading the fight to ensure that they have equality and are not put into that position. Ulysses. Not here. Tom Brake. Not here. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. Mr. Brake is here. And he's always here. And he stands every week. And he's going to be heard, Mr. Brake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The president of the CBI said today that sections of the UK car industry face extinction unless the UK stays in the EU customs union. Is there any level of damage inflicted by Brexit that will cause the Prime Minister to consider supporting a final say on the deal for the people and a chance to exit from a, a, a disastrous Brexit, something I could also put to the Leader of the Opposition. Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that, uh, as I have said many times in this House, we are looking to ensure that the future customs arrangement we have with the European Union enables us to have as frictionless trade with the European Union as possible, uh, no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, but also enable us, enables us to have an independent trade policy and negotiate trade deals around the world. I have been clear in a number of answers in this House this afternoon that I and this Government will deliver on the vote of the British people to leave the European Union. And I seem to remember that there was a time when the Liberal Democrat Party thought the people should have the choice. Finally for today, Mr Ian Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. (laughs) Today marks the Princess Diana Award Stand Up to School Bullies Day. While much progress has been made, too many young people take their own lives as a result of bullying in schools. Will the Prime Minister congratulate the people at the Diana Awards for their work and recommit her government to tackling this scourge? Can I, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this? Can I say I am very happy to join with him in congratulating the work of all those involved in the Diana Award uh, and to say that this is a really important issue that he has raised. We have made progress, but as he has pointed out, too many young people are bullied in schools, and sadly that sometimes has tragic consequences. Uh, we are providing funding, £1.7 million over the next two years, for four anti-bullying organisations, one of which is the Diana Award. But more does need to be done, as he says, and we will continue to press hard on this issue uh, and uh, to work hard to eliminate this bullying. Order. I must just say-